So you saw Sexually Frank first or what? Yes, because I figured the, that was the earlier one. I'll give the audience background for those who haven't seen it, which is most of them. The third feature film shot in the summer of 2010, uh, released in 2012. It screened at the Sydney Underground Film Festival. I flew to Australia to show it. It was really great because the it was, the Sydney School of the Arts was part of this giant film festival. 2010 was a time when independent film was coming out of like the Dogma 95 style, the kind of like DV cam obstructionist digital period. And 2010 was kind of where you start to see a lot of like mumblecore, extremely naturalistic acting, a lot of improvisation. And I think you could say that this movie is of that era a bit, but it's all scripted and uh, yeah, it's starring my wife one of my best friends from childhood, so it's all non-actors for the most part. So I, I um, subtitled this movie uh, Tone the Ass Movie, because that's yep. kind of the main takeaway I got from it. Um, it's an ensemble movie. There's a few stories. And one of them is that the character that I play um, is making like internet sketch content in a very early YouTube, I guess. The sketch is about like how much money would you accept for various you know like acts? And the joke is like, for 40 bucks, I would have somebody stick a toe in my ass. And then when he uploads it to the internet, uh, the person that starred in it regrets it. And then the movie's a little bit about that. And, and you, you actually did stick a toe in, uh, seemingly in, in an ass. I was like, wow, okay. He, That's he my, really yeah, well, we, we, we had to, right? Like you can't, it's like, uh, uh, what do you call it? Chekhov's gun. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's Fran's asshole. Um, it's, it was my toe and that's the, it's my wife's butt is the stunt butt. Yeah. Nice. It's a stunt, it's a stunt ass. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a note on here that like, you guys also know Lloyd Kaufman. Yes. 10 pounds was made. My first feature was made as a trauma move. I mean, I was inspired primarily by trauma. And so it got into Trauma Dance. It won Trauma Dance in 2006. It was really cool. They sent, I won like $100 worth of Kodak film. And then they distributed 10 pounds. They never released it on DVD, but it's on Trauma now, their streaming service. And then uh, I asked Lloyd, to, since I got to know him at the film festival, I, uh, I asked him to be an Abo. So he cameoed in Abo. And then I saw him again in 2012 on the set of Newcomb High, uh, Return to Newcomb High. My friend was shooting a documentary about him. So yeah, I've, and I've interviewed him for my podcast. So yeah, I've talked Darn. to him many times. So someone who's who's been in the nerd bedroom or basement, has, yeah. you also know it's like 10 degrees of separation or whatever it's called. We say we, we, we love James and we're parallel to him in many <laughs> ways. I have on here... Living in L.A., did you did you you didn't film this in L.A., did you? No, um, I went to L.A. in 2007, and I moved back after six months. It was part of like an internship program. I worked at 20th Century Fox Television Casting. Um, I worked for the woman who casted Arrested Development. She was like oh, a nice. like a, a uh, eccentric, you know, television executive type, and I got to drive the little golf carts around. I drove Fred Willard and Kelsey Grammer to a oh. reading of Back to You, a very short-lived sitcom. But no, then I came home and that's when I decided I'd like to make another independent movie and we did Sexually Frank. So, th and this movie was a departure because the last two were like high concept, absurdist comedies. And so this was kind of like the first time I was going to make something that, you know, took place on planet Earth. So how did you go about like securing locations just in general? There's a lot of locations in this movie. And then there's even like a, like a festival scene or whatever. Like oh, yeah. how, how do you go about doing that? Like that seemed like it would have been a lot, like a lot of work. Cause there's a lot of locations in that movie. Yeah. We never did permits or any of the things you're supposed to do. Um, you know, it was all guerrilla filmmaking for the most part. If it was a private business, like for instance, we shoot in the theater seats of this, of the Zyterian theater in new Bedford. Um, we asked, we just said, we're, you know, and, a lot of times the way it works is like you ask if somebody's going to be there at a time when it's closed and they go, yeah, you know, we, or occasionally they'll be like, yeah, if you could just like cover the guy's hourly rate or something like 50 bucks, um, you yeah, know, we can do it. And then the big thing is just say that you'll be quick, say that like you'll, it won't be more than an hour or it won't be more than an hour and a half and just have your shit together and shoot it really quickly and you can get out of there. But I, I don't, I think what's actually Frank, I don't remember paying for any of the locations the, uh, you're referring to the, um, the, uh, the pride festival in Providence. Um, we literally just went when pride was happening and we shot our movie like, wow. while like shoot the rodeo. 
Yeah, you know, just just did it with the background action all live, and the, and we did that like in Abo. There's a Christmas parade. We did the same thing. We it was supposed to be like a newscast in front of a Christmas parade. We just put actors in front of it and acted like they were newscasting. And it, I'm glad you asked about locations because I really believe that it's one of the best things that somebody who's making a like a micro budget movie can do, like locations are you know really really uh, I mean the production value they add to your film can't really be like overstated oh yeah one scene that like uh didn't look so great to me was the was your bedroom scene like the lighting was right. um inconsistent with right. um and I, just how it looked in general i agree um i think it was over color corrected thinking back on it there the guy we we did it in apple color and i think we over processed it and we definitely didn't know what we were doing with lighting in that room it's hard it, to write to light bedrooms and make them like look really like cinematic yeah, yeah, it was shot flat on um like H two six four. So like in like a kind of like old profiles, if I remember correctly. So you, you had to like really stretch the uh the 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 footage to get get it to back to the proper diamond dynamic range. There's a profile that we've loaded onto the cameras that flattens everything. We flatten the look. It looks like raw film almost, and it has a little of a pastelish look, and it's nice and ugly. This is obviously daylight that we're seeing here. It's late evening, you got a lot of ambient light coming in from the city. We want it to look like night, and there's not much, you know, it's kind of pastelish in the skin tones, not much definition. So, here's what it is afterwards. Now we got some nighttime. Got some nice light hitting him on the side of the face here, as if it's like street light coming in. A nice cool blue, like later at night. We want to make sure that when we shoot, that we have a range of lights from zero to 100, zero being true black, 100 being true white, and that's all being recorded into the sensor. That was the 7D, and the 7D was the cheapest of the, we shot the whole movie on the 7D. Yeah, we probably shouldn't have color corrected it so much. That would have been a better yeah, thing. You probably shouldn't even have like shot it flat. <laughs> I think it was hard to get it back to, because the, the, the compression was so much. It was so, so long ago, 13 the other, years ago. The other scenes though, I, 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 I thought looked really good and, um, you know, like good acting on on your part, Frankie. I mean, I I, I guess it kind of helped. That I already like knew who you were, so right. it's like, oh, there's the guy I know. And he, <laughs> but like, um, yeah, I, I always thought you were funny in both movies. Um, it, your acting seemed very natural. It didn't seem, you know, like forced or anything like that. Um, That's so good. how was it um, working with kids? Yeah, Abo, sexually frank, and having fun up there. It was on Abo that I learned that, like, if you live near a city, you can put out casting calls. You know, you can go to, uh, at the time we used this thing called NewEnglandActor.com or NewEnglandFilm.com. And you just put up classifieds and you get the weirdest people. You get, like, homely, <laughs> strange, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, former bus drivers. I remember there was this old lady that I ended up casting. She put her in Abo and she's in, a, in Sexually Frank for a moment. Um, but she, like, like, commuted from New York to be in our stupid fucking movies. Um, just, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of people out there. They're just looking for something to do. Anyway, the point is, is like, you you say non-union, you say free, you say that it's not going to take too long. You schedule it around them and you can get people of any, um, any age, you know, you audition them over zoom, right? So you can churn through a lot, you know, kiss a lot of frogs. Um, do you end up, uh, we've found some really interesting, like the, the, uh, woman who plays, uh, Maria who plays, Carla and having fun up there. I met her through that process. She had, she was like a pretty prolific actress in Boston and um, she ended up being like a really, really good fit for us. So uh, some, you know, I, I, it's like anything, like I prefer to work with people I already know cause we have a shorthand and I can get something out of them, you know, like with Keith, for, like I really love Keith's performance in sexually Frank dude's not an actor at all, but I know him down to his white meat. But you know, when you have like actual, like Maya who plays the blonde in Sexually Frank, like she was another one like that. She's like a trained actress. The main character in Having Fun Up There, the band guy, what's his name? John Ryan. John Ryan. Yeah, that, that guy was, that guy's a, a pretty damn good actor as well. Yeah, he ended up uh, uh, working at IGN for like 10 years. He was like an on-camera personality. He's like, if you look up John Ryan IGN, you'll see all kinds of IGN videos with him in it. And uh, he was always amazing to work with. I remember the experience of shooting those two movies were extremely different. Sexually Frank was across a summer. It was like summer camp. It was like on the weekends, we'd get together and we'd schedule stuff and we'd shoot kind of at our leisure. And the reason for that was because the movie couldn't come out until I had finished my Masters of Fine Arts. And so I was way ahead of schedule. Like I, it was going to be my thesis film. So I was way ahead of schedule. And I couldn't release it until 2012. So I ended up workshopping it in school and around friends for like two years, which was actually a great experience because people, 
there was a lot of stupid criticism, but there was a lot of like people would just poke holes in it all day until finally you're like, oh, everybody's confused about Frank's motivation by this act. And you could actually insert scenes. You know, so we did that. And I, I was in a few of those screenings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. EJ was at some of, you know, where I was having, having fun if they were shot in nine days because, and the reason was because we knew we wanted John Ryan to play that character. It seemed like such a, such a fit. And he was living in San, uh, San Francisco. So we flew him out and he could only, he was taking a, like a vacation week. And so he slept right here where I am recording this podcast. He worked for IGN. So I remember, GTA five had just come out and he had to review it. And so at nighttime we'd come home and he'd have to play a bunch of GTA five. <laughs> I think if I were to make another feature, we would do it like that again. We would do like the, okay, everybody take a week off and we're just going to shoot this fucker and whatever yeah. we can get, we're going to get Knock you know? it out. You have a one scene in sexually Frank that I made note of where the camera's panning from one bedroom to another. And it almost looks like a rail shot. Like how yeah. did you get that shot? That was a, uh, it was very popular at the time to use sliders and we were part of that trend. It was, so it's like a, it is a rail, but it just sits on a tripod. And if you shoot with, it was, it was actually a junt had a 10 millimeter lens. So super wide. We shot a few box max with the 10 millimeter lens on a, on a 70. Yes. So like it, some of the, you know, just a few of the early ones. Yeah. That's actually Frank 70 shot some box max. Yeah. It would, yeah. It added, uh, it, it was definitely more, um, cinematic and I, that I appreciated that, yeah, um, so it literally just sits on a tripod and just it's just somebody gently moving it okay. left to right. Yeah, so, your voice sounded like deeper, for, or it sounded different. It doesn't because I, I don't know if it's uh, the YouTube or whatever, but your voice just sounded different in those in those films. Which... And I would like notes, which means uh, a little bit more than just yeah, it's fine, I'm good. The fuck do you want from me? One one line that I really liked from Sexually Frank, I think it was when the two gay guys were like getting into a fight. Uh, this fucking cat. Like, I really like that line. <laughs> this fucking cat. You want to touch? Ow! What the fuck? Don't shove around the cat. I'm gonna throw the fucking thing out the window next time. Ow! Fuck! My friends Aaron and Mike are, are those characters. And I met, like, I, I, we were really close at the time. And I remember they would get in, in fist fights. <laughs> and. You know, now they weren't punching each other in the face, but when they got in an argument, they would wrestle. And yes. I was just like, so this is what it's like to be gay. <laughs> <laughs> I've never once like, like come to blows with Nina and the police weren't involved. You know? <laughs> How did you consistently capture good audio and dialogue? Because it doesn't matter like what the scene is. The, the, the audio is always clear and there's no like, I don't know, any other extraneous sound. It's, it's it, the audio capture was really good. Yeah, well, so uh, all the credit to John, to Junt. Um, he was audio on this movie and on Having Fun Up There. And so this was like we had um, we had two cinematographers because we had two 7Ds. That was literally the reason. Um, so we had one guy who was like sort of a good videographer named Dan. And he was nor he normally ran pri you know, the primary camera. And then Kyle ran secondary. And then Kyle would go on to shoot Having Fun Up There by himself. But, um, but then John would, he had an Ederol R44 fields recorder xlr inputs for the lapel mics and they're the same lapel packs that we use to this oh, day. oh so you were using i didn't even see i mean i guess that's the point is that you don't see them but yeah, usually someone could like tape them like in the collar yeah where you we always use them. tape we didn't use clips um, Ah, okay okay that makes sense it would be like it would normally be like, like a little bit to the right and yeah and tape it down but uh, frequently if we went through the bloopers, we would frequently hear people being like, I can see your mic. I can see the tape. I'm like, <laughs> doing that the whole time. But yeah, it, so then he monitored wirelessly. So it was all shot non-sync. So when I brought in every take, I had to sync every take to the audio that he had recorded. So, no. of course, we had to call each shot and clap in each shot. Otherwise, I'd get lost. And it was way worse on having fun up there because we shot that movie on this kind of like, like um, I don't know, like pirated firmware yeah. this magic, like, magic magic lantern a magic, yeah, this lantern, magic lantern, which lantern thing at the time would only shoot the image so it was basically like shooting on film so yeah. you had to yeah you had to really clap and you had to see the clap yeah because the only thing you could sync it to was the visual of the hands coming together and then yeah so like i, I spent just the first month bringing in footage and syncing it all and then it was ready to be edited but it was always um because then, it, you know, if, of course, if you have your audio track separated and isolated, right, if there's if one person has a scratch or something like that, you can always jump to another mic. So I don't think we did any. In my first movie, we did a lot of ADR 
and I regretted it deeply because <laughs> it all looks terrible and we're really bad at doing it. And, um, inevitably you lose performances. And, you know, so I was like, we can't do ADR anymore. Let's just get the, let's get the audio right. And so he did a great job. Why don't TV shows do it like that? Because anytime you see behind the scenes, they've got this big boom and this they big have a boom operator overhead yeah. mic, and it and it it's like automated to like go to like whatever actors start speaking. Why not just throw lapel mics on all of them? I wonder. I think they probably do both, right? In a lot of I would places. I would assume they would do both, or um, yeah. But if they do have boom operators, it might be easier because well, yeah. One of the things that that goes wrong with lapels, I mean, lots can go wrong with lapels. You can see them, of course. I mean, if you have like certain costuming or something, it's there. It's basically unworkable. Is where would you hide the pack? Like yeah. we would, we, we ran into that problem on occasion. Um, but if you, you know, anybody with pockets, but even still, it's kind of like bulbous in your pocket. Um, so that's one reason. Another reason is with lapel mics, you don't really capture um, tone. So if you're like outdoors or something, and everybody sounds too clean, you know, you have like no yeah, like atmospheric I sound. How the fuck did you get this southern ass lady? Up up north in your movie. Doesn't that mean that you guys been seeing each other since you were 14? So you're referring to a character who is like a traditionally minded and she's pushing all of her tradition. Nowadays, I am that woman, you know, um, <laughs> like to me, that mo- that woman is the star of the movie now. But we were we were mocking her at the time because we were do a remake from her p- perspective. <laughs> I should make a sequel or like I I rebut everything from the first movie. Um but she, uh, it was written to be like a, like a, a mass hole, like a, oh my God, are you going to get fucking married and have fucking kids with each other guy? <laughs> you know? uh, and then in, we were auditioning people and we needed somebody age appropriate and in comes the Southern woman. With Bill and I, I said, I'm not going to spend a bunch of money. It'll just be me and a few close friends and relatives and cousins. And it'll be like a little thing on the beach. No big deal. That's one of the fun, happy accidents of like auditioning performers is somebody comes in with a totally different persona than you had imagined. And then you're like, I think that actually somehow works better than we had envisioned it. Yeah, that was shocking. I was like watching this movie and I, and knowing, you know, where y'all are from and everything. And all of a sudden you got old, you know, <laughs> grandma in here giving you all kinds of <laughs> advice and information. Yeah, that's more your neck of the woods, right? Oh, yeah. So yeah. so to me, I was like, grandma? Yeah, was like, <laughs> so again, I was going to grad school at the time and there was a there was a cinematography professor named C.E. that E.J. knows. His name is C.E. Courtney, and he was one of the most wonderful people I talk about. He was a, also a Southern boy, and he was a, he was like a Hollywood cinematographer, and he took a lot of interest in the movie, and he was like really helpful, and he ended up lighting some of the scenes and uh, having fun up there, actually. He was doing like a cinematography study of Sexually Frank for the benefit of our cinematographers, because they were kind of new, and they wanted to hear what he had to say. And there's a shot of Sa- the character Sarah sitting in her car with an open window, and he's like, that's the shot from Koyana Scotsy <laughs> with the, uh, the, uh, the experimental film. I love that. I love Koyana Scotsy. I named my first album Koyana Scotsy because uh, I, I, I loved the film so much and I loved the kind of what it, what it uh, illustrates, you know, how it's like. It's wonderful. Yeah. Y- yeah. Like, and then Philip Glass. I mean, the score by Philip Glass is incredible. <laughs> the end of Koyana Scotsy, they flash up, they put like this Chiron on the screen. And it's like Koyana Scotsy from the Hopi uh, Native American language, meaning life in turmoil, needing a new way to live and something else. Cause it's showing the beauty and wonder of nature. And this was back in the eighties, but like the, the, f- the film footage is so HD and it looks so goddamn good to yeah. see the grand Canyon and it's this looming like music that like makes it seem like this alien land and it sounds so evil and then like it it's it's slowly like it's showing like water flowing in slow motion and it's got like this huge epic score behind it and then it slowly starts showing how like earth movers and big ass dump trucks and like 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 some kind of a cabling that runs for miles 
And then it starts showing, you know, people la- sitting on a beach with like a nuclear power plant in the background. And then, and then finally, there's this like overhead shot. And yes, now I'm talking about Quentin Scotty. Fuck your movies. Um, <laughs> I agree. It shows this overhead shot of of the city, and, and it just looks like a big computer circuit board. And this is all nonfiction. This is just shit they filmed. Uh, it shows this rocket that goes up into space and it explodes and this one piece of debris is slowly going down to earth in slow motion with this very haunting uh, like organ and that's when they flash up Koya Scotsy requiring a new way to live, life in turmoil and all that. And it gave me fucking goosebumps because I'm like, oh my God, like that's so... No, it's a great that's... it's a great meditative, like if you can get the 4K Blu-ray of that or something and just like kick back when the house oh, is yeah. empty <laughs> and just stare at it. <laughs> And so, yeah, I named my, my first album that, and I, I I composed the album art for it, which was a composition of two pictures I took in black and white photo class, uh, which I love, that picture. Um, all this is on Spotify, by the way, Dancing with Ghosts, if you want to check it out. But um, the first song is called Life in Turmoil, and the last song is called A New Way to Live. Um, and then, So really only, like, art house nerds who were alive in the... 80s or 70s would get the reference but hey you know what i didn't didn't know what i was doing in, in film school it was a big deal it was a big deal because oh, really? it was it, it, well everybody wants to make an experimental film because it's it i think the barrier of entry is lower hmm. but and you're and because you're learning you're like well maybe i can stumble upon something you know there's a lot of people that wanted to make experimental work and quayana scotsi is a great example of like no this is actually the power of of experimental film if you you know like but, but as you can see you you <laughs> you have to work hard at that too unfortunately yeah. <laughs> oddly enough for me Can't like, just fart it out yeah i was like walking it was like back when we still had like cable like hbo or whatever i was like walking out of my house to go to school or something and it was on because my parents just always left the fucking tv on growing up like it was never turned off it was like the fifth member of the family and so this movie was playing, and I was like, oh, this is kind of weird. Like, there's no dialogue or anything. It's just, like, uh, showing a bunch of scenes of people or whatever. And I picked up the remote and I to see what the name of the movie was. And it was – when I saw the title, I was like, what the fuck? That's a very bizarre name that I can't even pronounce. And so I, like, jotted it down or something. I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pirate this later on tonight. Let's see what this is about. <laughs> and I ended up, you know – I, w- I was into the the artsy fartsy stuff even at a young age, so I really enjoyed it. And there's there's yeah. really good artsy fartsy stuff. There's a lot of bad artsy fartsy. But there's a lot yeah. of yeah. Oh yeah, I, I make a lot of videos about the bad stuff, um, <laughs> musically speaking. Yeah, they, they have a website for that. It's called Vimeo. Vimeo. <laughs> <laughs> Check it out. Okay, this is another possibly drunken note. Uh, <laughs> who is the guy who is pedo? Oh. <laughs> I know. I mean, all right. So for those who haven't seen the movie, Neil is, is one of the main characters. He's kind of like a computer developer, part of the friend group. And he's going to work every day. And there's this guy there, this older guy he works with, who's kind of a pariah. And there's like this, you know, really annoying uh, office mate who keeps like giving him dirty looks and calling the guy creepy and kind of putting him down and making him feel unwanted. And, uh, and then you find out that the guy actually like did some time for a, uh, uh, like being with an underage person, but he was based on this dude on YouTube that was blowing up around that time. He had like broken teeth, a big smile. Kachaturians saber dance. <laughs> Kachaturians saber dance. I don't know, the, the face on this guy, like, captured my imagination. He, he ended up dying, this guy. I have an update for you about Ed. Ed has a tumor in his neck, and he's also having trouble breathing. He has some sort of infection in his lungs. I don't know if it's pneumonia or something else. You find, found out that this dude did some time for being with, like, an underage boy. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, I, it, it's kind of like in the movie where you suddenly, like, you're like, this person that I've been watching actually is, like, involved. Okay, like, so- I'm just glad there was a pedo in the movie because if not, then <laughs> I really need to rethink my drinking. Uh, and... <laughs> as far as who the actor was, it was a, it's somebody who auditioned from Boston and uh, who was a really nice guy. And um, to his credit, I remember because he had to do some really weird shit in the movie. He had to, to like 
take his shirt off and, and put paint in his nipples and do all this crazy shit. And I wasn't, it was in the script and I asked him to read it, but I, I didn't, when we met, I wasn't like, now you're good with the nipple stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of just, just showed up expecting him to shoot it. And he did. And, <laughs> and he went for yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, so he, 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 he got a lot of, uh, he got a lot of real estate at the, uh, for the end, the end credits or whatever. She's filled out here. Some of you don't like that. I like that a lot. Five foot five. That's good for me. She and I would see eye to eye, literally. So, okay, this is this is this is a uh, a social um, uh, pat on the back. I love how you casted a gay guy not as a stereotypical gay guy. Um, I mean, I know you guys are intelligent dudes, so you'd probably be smart enough to not do that. But uh, you know, in 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 those independent movies uh, made by younger people, I think the temptation is always there to like, you know, let's go extreme and. It'll be hilarious, but that's boring. Well, I mean, the movie uh, thematically is about different dynamics with different sexualities, and it's about the characters. Like, it's not about like character equals gay guy. It's the character is a full person, and I right. I remember think I remember thinking it was novel to introduce a character and not reveal that they're gay for like a scene and a half. Let you organically find out that they're gay later. Again, leading with the character and then adding their attributes later. Yeah, see, it's, unlike me, I don't have that luxury because as soon as someone sees my hair and my piercings, they know I'm gay, so I don't have the, <laughs> the luxury. One of the characters, the one that John Ryan plays, is kind of like, you know, he's unapologetically gay, but he doesn't really want to be part of gay culture. His boyfriend yeah. does. His boyfriend really enjoys it. I liken it to being like, you know, you're a woman, but you're not super feminine. No, I, I DJed at a gay bar for, for like seven years. And um, there are, I've definitely run into gay guys up there who I'm like, oh, hey, I haven't seen you in here in a while. And they're like, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't really like going to gay clubs. We thought it was fun. Like, and again, it was based on, to some degree, on my friend Aaron, but also... Like, Jun is gay, and he also, like, just doesn't identify with gay culture generally. So we thought it was cool to be like, how about this character dresses up like Dracula to kind of make fun of the costume party that Pride is. And then in both this movie and Having Fun Up There, in Having Fun Up There, Hana is, it has, a like, a zombie, gory makeup. But I think we liked the idea both times of you end up in a really serious conversation or you have you have a really serious inflection point with some relationship and you're dressed up like an idiot. (laughs) (laughs) Filming inside a car is hard. That's one of my notes. Oh my, well, you know what? I would never, this is the kind of shit that a 22 year old does that a 37 year old would not do. We wanted to mount a camera. One of these for us at the time, and you know, a $2,000 camera at that time was like, don't break it. And uh, we wanted to mount it to the car because we wanted to have this shot uh, you know, a two shot of passenger and driver and then a two shot of the two people in the back. And I knew that they made these like suction cup things. So literally like it's like industrial suction, sh- suction cups. And f- somehow Dan and John both allowed us to do that with their cameras and drive around the block. And I would not, I just wouldn't do it nowadays. I'd just be like, it's not worth it. We'll get a different shot, but it ends up looking pretty cool. Yeah. Cause I'm like, usually you need some kind of hardcore rigging to get a shot like that. I, think oh yeah how did you get cops and cop cars that was one of two times that i've shot a cop scene you know the cop is just an actor in in a costume and that guy by the way i saw him as a background extra in don't look up (laughs) the guy who plays the cop is actually frank but we shot at this chinese place in my town and i always drove by it and i always thought well that seems quiet we could go there so we show up one day and we're like can we shoot here and they're like yeah sure but it was obvious that like they weren't ready for customers. There were like newspapers all over the counter and like, they, like some grandma came down in like a nightgown from the top floor. And so anyway, they let us shoot there and then we shot the exterior and it's just my Ford that I was driving at the time with a $20 blue light inside of it. So there's no cop car. It's just the light inside of a Ford. Oh, okay. Could have fooled me. Uh, yeah, well, you know, if you put it in the background and you let it reflect on the actor's eyes and stuff and, you you know, yeah. you give that impression. But I'll say like a year or two later, I shot this short film called Vibes and there's a deleted scene where we have a cop and we have a cop car and people around us called the cops on us. They're like they're impersonating officers out here. They're shooting some kind of weird movie and the cops showed up and told us to stop. Do you ever inform anybody that you're doing this? we got neighbors calling up. They're all sorry about oh, that. Sorry. We, we, we thought it was OK because I actually live here and it's well, it is public because it's public for the residents that are here. I, I see. It's a $500 fine, you know. 
have that blue line you do. I, yeah, I know it's there. I, I, Is it really? Yeah, it's, yeah. That's what I was permit. saying. You need a permit from that's a police what I was saying. chief. Yeah. But it's actually, Frank, we're doing it like in the middle of the night. We're doing it in front of like kind of a suspicious <laughs> location. And it's actor. I'm really shocked that nobody stopped it. But man, when you're young, you'll do anything to just shoot your stupid movie. I, I sometimes think about like, especially in our first movie, I remember we shot this scene in a funeral home with like a real sword and, and like an unloaded gun and stuff. And it's the kind of thing like I'd walk in on like a bunch of 16 year olds, no adult supervision shooting something. I just shut it down and be like, guys, some, you're going to kill each other in here. <laughs> You'd narc on them so fast. I would. I really would. It, it, my dad once told me, he's like, you get older, you lose your balls. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's true. I didn't know. It is, that's totally true. I don't know what happens. <laughs> then the final thing I have for Sexually Frank, uh, bedroom scene. There's a wide shot right before the credits. Looks like Super 8 almost. Again, it's in our bedroom. It's over color corrected. I think it's real blue. It looks like a Disney Plus film nowadays. <laughs> Hey, Neil. Hey, Jen. I got a new t-shirt. Yeah, look at that. It's uh, got a robot, you know, having an excellent time. Bye. So, who's that? Your boyfriend. I feel my love. Yeah, that was him. So what's he doing? I've got scripts. What, another sketch online? Oh my god, this is twisted. I can't even say it out loud. To complete your training, I will give you five bucks if you stick your toe up my ass. We gotta cut, I'm gonna fall. Weren't you guys getting married soon? I don't remember saying that. Okay. But just don't let him talk you out of anything you really want. Why are you so sure this is something I want? See, that's why you're a 24-year-old virgin, man. Neil's one of the uh, computer code guys. Am I describing that right? Perfectly, yes. No one else would be okay with this. What? Being ignored so you can talk to your ex. You hit me one more time and I'm breaking up with you. Lord, give me the strength. So Matt's never slept with another guy? No. Probably why he broke up with you. Thanks, dumb truck. Give me plenty of time to purge this sucker before rush hour at the ladies' room. You make this sketch, and it's all about open sexuality. It's about a toe going in your ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's going on this green, Frank? Penises. Giant penises shooting by the windows. Just don't make fun of me about the whole virgin thing. We do that because we love you, dude. Oh, right. You make fun of me because you love me? Yes! I'm making you come. What would it take?